Good morning, good morning, everybody. <laughs> All right, so who's in Miami uh, right now? Right, right now it's Carla and Melissa. We we have two very dedicated agents <laughs> in English here <laughs> in Miami. Yesterday we had twenty in Spanish. We had two in English today, but that's fine. That's fine. We we're gonna keep. Uh, we we'll we'll get more followers in English as as people get uh, accustomed to also being trained in English. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the ASIS residential contract. Since we're talking about uh, the sales contract, both in Miami and Orlando and Naples, I wanna make some, um, some things clear. Miami, Orlando, Tampa, and Kissimmee, they use the same contract. Naples, can use the same as is contract, but Naples also has its own association contract. What is that? Why is that important? Because some agents in Naples, some listing agents in Naples like to use the contract that they use in Naples. But you know, if you feel more comfortable using the DVPR contract, it's fine. We can use the DVPR contract in Naples as well. Why? Because it's for Florida. So it's the same contract for the state of Florida. All right. So so that you know. And the same thing goes for the same thing goes for the for the addendums. Um, is the same. Uh, Orlando, Miami, Naples, they use the same, the same contracts. There are one big difference between Miami and Orlando, uh, Naples and Kissimmee as far as submitting an offer. And it is that in Miami, the buyer usually chooses the title company. Therefore, it pays for the title company. Okay, where in Orlando, Naples, Tampa, the seller is the one who chooses the title company and they pay for the uh, title owner's insurance. Now, I want to make sure that we understand this, and is that is, is a customary uh, thing to do. Is not that it's mandatory to do it that way. In other words, even though in Orlando is the 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 the, the seller is who one who chooses the title company, in the middle of of submitting the offer, if we are the ones trying to buy the property, we can submit the offer where we choose the title company. It's just that our client, our buyer, has to understand that um, that they'll be paying for for the title, for the for the title insurance. Okay, so that's that's one thing that I wanted to get out of, um, you know, that I wanted to tell everybody, so everybody <clears throat> understands that. Okay, all right. Um, so let's go to the nitty gritty of things. All right, so here we have that loop. Everybody knows that we work with that loop. And what I'm going to do today, I'm not going to show you how to use that loop per se, but I'm going to I'm going to create a dot loop um, for a for a purchase contract, so that you guys you know get get familiar. Although a lot of you have already done it before. All right, so I'm going to add a a loop really quick, and uh, I don't know. Can can someone? Oh, I have it here. Let me see if I can have here an MLS number really quick. I'm just gonna do one MLS number, any MLS number that I have here really quick, just for the purpose of. Uh, all right, so I'm gonna go here, type in the MLS number. Usually that loop pulls the information uh, from the MLS and I'm gonna select what type of deal I'm doing. And right now I'm, I'm either buying a, a single family home or I'm buying a town home or I'm buying a, a condo. So I have to choose uh, which loop I'm gonna have. Why is that important? Because once you choose the package, the system is set up to bring all the documentation needed for that particular deal. 
And this works the same in Orlando, in Tampa, in Naples, Miami, and so on and so forth. So here we have the documentation. There's already a preset in that loop um, to, to submit an offer. All right, so let's go right into the offer. So here's the as is contract. Um, and I'm just gonna go through it really quick. All right, so there. Okay, so the first line obviously is the buyer. And I wanna say something about the buyer. If, if the buyer, I'm sorry, the first line is, I have so many things open that I can see there and this here. All right, so the first line is the seller. So I wanna say something about the names that go either for the seller or the buyer. Those names, if they're a company, if there's a company that owns the property or there's a company that is buying the property, you have to ask for their, um, their information from SunBiz if the property is in Florida, because we have to see who is allowed to sign, who's the legal representative of that property that is allowed to sign. So even though we will put down the name of the company, if it's the seller is the company, is the owner of the company or the buyer is the one, the, the company is the one buying the property, we still have to find out who owns the company and we need to get that information through their, oh my God, I'm skipping the name of the document. Yeah, but what's the name of the document? Um, the articles of incorporation. Thank you, uh, Andres. So we have to ask for the articles of incorporation that will come from some base in order to find out who owns the company. <clears throat> so that person is who signs the document, even though they will have the name as the buyer or the seller of the company here. All right. Uh, next, we'll talk about the property description address, county, the folio number um, or property ID number, and the legal description, okay? That information is very important to have. Although it changes from county to county, the amount of legal description that is available on public records. So mm -hmm. if that's the case, the main thing is to have the folio number. If we have the folio number, even if the legal description is, is not correct or is incomplete, because sometimes when you're pulling the information from, from public records, um, it doesn't show the entire legal description. The only way to verify the entire legal description will be to go into the documents uh, of the title and then you can see the entire legal description. But if not, at least make sure that we have the folio number and we can verify that information. We can verify that information. If we are, so let's say this is the property that we're working on. And this works the same for, for Miami, Orlando, Naples, Tampa. You can go to IMAP or you can go to Realist. You can click on either of these icons here and if you click on IMAP, let's just try IMAP. Here, right on top left corner, you can see the uh, folio number for the property. So we, we need to make sure that this folio number is the same folio number that is showing up on the offer. Okay, so far so good. Any questions? No. No? All right. Let's just say that um, so we, we already checked this initial uh, property information, buyer and seller. Now we're going to start uh, writing the offer for, to, to submit the offer. Okay, so before we submit the offer, before we actually get here into that loop, we have to speak to the loan officer. We have to ask the loan officer exactly what type of loan, are we working with, even though we, we had already spoken to them, to the loan officer, we should have spoken to the loan officer before, but at this point, before we submit the offer, we have to 
um, verify with the loan officer what type of loan are we doing, what type of interest rate are we getting, more or less, how long is going to take this loan officer to close on this particular loan. And this is important to understand that we have to ask the loan officer because not every loan, not every borrower better is the same. Uh, I have Andres here who's a loan officer as well. And, and he can tell me that some, some borrowers are very diligent and they bring the information right away so you can close within 30 days. But some borrowers are a pain in the neck and, and it'll take them 45 days to close. Some borrowers we have to as a loan officer, we have to um, still fix some credit issues or stuff like that. So ask the loan officer how long it will take that loan officer to close the deal. And most importantly, how long for, it will take that loan officer to produce the approval letter. Okay? And this is me even before even opening the, the loop. We have to know how long it will take to close, how long it will take the loan officer to produce the approval letter. And we'll, we'll go into details um, when we get there. Okay. Um, it's not you as the realtor or the buyer who decide the day of closing. The day of closing is decided by what information the loan officer is giving you and also negotiating with the listing agent uh, to see what works for the seller. But it's not me as a buyer agent or the buyer himself deciding, oh, I'm not closing 20 days. No, it doesn't work like that. Because if the loan officer is not ready to close in 20 days and you submit an offer to close in 20 days, then we have to start sweating bullets to try to get an extension. So, and you don't, you don't wanna do that, all right? So first talk to your loan officer to see what's, um, what kind of a uh, time frame is the, law, the loan officer being able to work with? All right, so far so good? Yeah, we understand that part, right? All right, good. Yeah. Okay, so um, here on number uh, 20 and number 24, we have to, um, what kind of personal property is gonna be included or excluded from the contract? On the contract itself, on the contract itself, it does not include washer and dryer as part of personal property, all right? So since it's not included on the contract itself, we have to make sure that we include it here and we have to type it. Uh, washer, washer and dryer. Uh, the following, my, oh, they are excluded. Sorry, they're excluded. They're not here, as in the other. So if washing, if the property does have washer and dryer, we have to make sure to include it in the offer, washer and dryer. Right up here. What properties are included that are not attached to the property, that are personal property. Washer and dryer are considered personal property. They're not fixtures of the property. All right. Um, all right. So make sure that you include that. If you don't include that, when you submit the offer and the, the seller accepts the offer without that information, and lo and behold, there is a nice washer and dryer in that house, the seller can take it with him. And guess who's going to have to pay for it? Because the buyer saw a washer and dryer when they want to see the property. So they saw the, they saw the property, they, they, they saw the washer and dryer, the seller took it, and then what are you going to do? Well, out of your commission, you're going to have to pay for washer and dryer. So make sure that you include that information in there. Also, if you're dealing with nice properties, even if they're not nice properties, but nowadays they have like nice, um, the, the wine cellars or drapes, drapes, uh, 
yeah, nice drapes and stuff like that, or if they have a nice chandelier, or, you know, whenever you see nice things in the house, as an agent, as a buyer agent, make sure you ask if that item is stained or not stained, because you have to put that on the offer. If you don't, and you just, you know, wish you wash that, that things happen magically, it's not. It has to be in writing in order to enforce it, okay? So if things are not, whatever is not going to be included in the purchase, if there's a, there's a nice chandelier or there's a TV, like for instance, this TV right now that is attached to the wall, all right? Can someone tell me if that TV, if this TV is a fixture or it's a personal item? Personal. It's a personal item? How do, how do we determine that this TV it's a personal item. Because you can take it out. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, because it's attached to the wall, it's attached to the wall. And uh, in Zoom, someone was saying something else in Zoom. What were, what were you guys saying in Zoom? Because you install it. And if you install it, you can take it out. OK. So the same in Zoom, they're saying the same thing. That is because it's attached to the wall. If you remove it, then it's a personal item if you can remove it. It's true, but it's not true if when you remove this TV, the mounted, the, 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 the bracket that is amounted to is, it makes a hole in the drywall, then it becomes a fixture. It's a small difference. So that means that the seller has to patch up the hole and make sure that there's no hole left behind. But if, mm -hmm. if this TV is removed and, you know, you just in, unscrew the bolts and what have you, then, yeah, it's a personal item. But if there's a hole left behind, then it wasn't a fixture. I mean, it wasn't a personal okay. item. It was a fixture. It should have stayed. Yeah. If, if the TV itself is, if like, if they made a hole, uh, uh, like a, like a space inside the drywall, a little cabinetry, that it becomes part of the house. The TV becomes mm -hmm. part of the house. So you have to understand that those issues, especially when you're dealing with high-end properties that may have those type of uh, fixtures or personal items. The seller, the question here in, in class, oh, but by the way, um, yeah, Wendy's having a lot of issues with the internet. Um, there, we have, uh, we have more, more, more participants here in the <laughs> office now. <All> right. so, <laughs> uh, so Carla is asking that if the seller has the right to remove the TV and fix, fix the hole and paint it, and yes, but we need to make sure that that's written on the contract. Oh, okay. That's why I'm making such a big point on this part of the contract, which almost nobody pays attention to it. But you know, if you're dealing with a regular property, then just add washer and dryer. But when you go and look at properties, make sure that you understand what type of property you're dealing with in order to submit the offer the correct way. Okay. All right. So let's move forward. Any questions? No. No, we're good? All right, excellent. Okay, so let's talk about purchase price. Obviously, you know, if they're asking $400,000 for the property, are we going to offer $400,000 for the property? No. Carmen, Carmen here in Miami says yes. How about in Zoom? No. No? We're not going to offer four hundred. dollars what, what are we going to offer? Mm. So Andres is saying 5,000 over. Carla, what are you saying? 15,000 over, I guess. 15,000 over? Yeah. For right now, how is the, is the market? The market. So Angel, Angel says uh, $15,000 yes. over. Yes. All right. say five. And Gertha says five. 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 All right. Anybody else? 25,000. 25,000 over and, and, and Tatiana is saying whatever the client says. Guys, the first rule of real estate 
before we submit an offer or before we get a listing, what do we have to do? Ask to the customer. Do a CMA. Oh my goodness. Thank you, Gertha. We have to do a CMA. We have to do a CMA. It doesn't matter that we're in a hot market or that we're in a slow market. It has nothing to do. We have to do a CMA. Why? Because it doesn't matter if we're in a hot market right now and we have to offer $25,000 or $50,000 $50, over the asking price. If that's the case, our buyer has to have that money to pay cash or, or to pay for the additional money over the appraisal value. So it, it, the first thing that we do is we run a, a comparable market analysis. Oh, to inform our buyer and for me as an agent to know what kind of offer should I submit? You know what I mean? Yes, right now it's true. We may have to submit an offer that is way above asking price, but that doesn't mean that the seller can afford to submit an offer that is, I mean, sorry, the buyer, that the buyer is, can afford to submit an offer that is above asking price. So if the property is the asking price is 400,000, okay? And we want to offer 420,000. <coughs> and we run our our CMA and our CMA tells us that the property might come in somewhere between 380 and 400. What what do I have to do? I have to tell the buyer that listen, the appraisal may not come in at 420. So if that's the case, you're going to have to come up with whatever closing costs you have, whatever down payment you have, and the difference between the purchase price and the appraisal value. So do you have $50,000 or $60,000 or $70,000 in your bank account to cover the difference? Wow. If they don't, then what's the point of sending that offer at, um, at $420,000? You know what I mean? What, you know, it, 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 we, just, we just work for no reason. We submitted an offer that our buyer is not able to, to afford. So the price, yes, is driven by the market and the final call is, is made by the seller, but we have to do a CMA to advise our buyer uh, to see what's the best, the best way to go about it, okay? So let's say that we're buying it for 410. Um, what should be a uh, good escrow amount to put on the offer? Is, is, there, is there like a mandatory amount that we should use as an escrow amount? No? No, no. Okay. What, Carmen, what should, it, what should we do? What should, how much should we put as, a, as an escrow? So Carmen here is saying five thousand. Gertha, how much should we put as escrow? Um, I would put if it's a four thousand, four hundred and ten thousand. No, I would say ten thousand. So Gertha is saying ten thousand. Angel, Angel, how much should we put as a as an escrow? No, you have to unmute yourself. Oh, sorry. I I, I put in twelve thousand. Twelve thousand. All right. Yeah. And Andres here is saying 10,000 uh, with the offer and 10,000 after the inspection period. All right. So yeah. all the numbers that are given are mm -hmm. fine. There's no rule of thumb. That, I mean, there's no mandatory amount. Now, the rule of thumb, it should be anywhere between 2 to 3% of the purchase price. Okay. If you want to do it up front with the offer, or you want to split it in two, like Andres okay. said, that you do, let's say, I don't know, let's say that this is 3%. 3% of 410 is, let's just say it's 12,000. So we can do 6,000 with the offer and then 6,000 upon uh, the inspection period is over. Or we can do 12,000 or we can do 10,000 or we can do 8,000. It's fine. You, it, it's, it's not a number that is mandatory, but it's more a number that it will be determined by the conversation that you have with the listing agent. Okay. 
It doesn't make a difference if it's conventional, if it's FHA. It does make a difference if it's a cash, if it's a cash purchase. Because, I mean, oh. if we're buying a $400,000 home, cash, those who made an offer with a $5,000 escrow deposit, it, it makes no sense. You know, $15,000, $25,000 in escrow is a more coherent offer. Andres. Okay. And Andres, and that's how much, how much? Andres is skilled in a, on, a, on a warehouse tomorrow, and the, the warehouse was 375000 cash, and they put $100,000 in escrow. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, it goes with what you're buying. If you're, if you're doing FHA, you're, you're doing 3.5% down payment, you know, 3% is fine. You know what I mean? You don't need to put 5% or anything like that because you're only doing 3.5% down payment. If you're doing a conventional and you put in 20% down payment, why not offer 5% in escrow? It makes a stronger offer. And that's what we want. We, whatever we do with the offer, the intent is to make it the strongest offer possible, especially in a market like today, all right? So there's no, two, there's no $2,000, $3,000 escrows uh, on, on properties today. Someone was going to ask a question? question? Yes, yes. Gertha. What about um, the VA loans? You still need a deposit because the VAs are 100% financing. It's true. It's true. But there is a uh, funding fee that okay. the, the, the borrower needs to pay at closing anyways. So that funding fee is 1.75, Andres, right? The funding fee for VAs. So, I mean, even... I'm sorry, 2.5. 2.5. Okay. Correct. So, so even though VAs are 100% financing, the funding fee of 2.5 is, is money that needs the, the buyer needs for closing. So you might as well put escrow for 2.5% of the purchase property. Okay. Yeah, and FHA is, is, is a fine, you can finance the... Um, Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It was three three thousand. Okay, three thousand. So so it was just a little bit over one percent of the purchase price. The buyer agent? Financing? Okay. All right, so Carmen... Car Carmen, Carmen, Carmen is telling us here that she had a listing worth two hundred and forty-eight thousand dollars. She got an offer on it, and the offer came in with a three thousand dollar escrow deposit. She asked for more escrow deposit, and the buyer agent wouldn't wouldn't put more, or, or not the buyer agent, but the, the buyer itself didn't put any more escrow. When and and this is this is a signal. Either when you are the buyer or where you are the listing agent and you, you receive an offer with such a low escrow, when you, when you do that, it's, a, it's signaling me, me as an agent that that buyer is not such a good or a strong buyer. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing a disservice to my seller to recommend that offer to be accepted because we're gonna take the property off the market and we're not gonna be able to accept a better offer pending that this offer goes through. And in this particular case, the offer, the, the buyer wasn't a strong buyer. And then a couple of, what, a week or two, a week, a week or two, they send the release and cancellation because they didn't get approved. They didn't get funding. Wow. So that's why they were very hesitant to put more wow. money in escrow because okay. they, they don't understand the process and they think 
that if they put money in escrow, it's putting money at risk. And it is. It is fun. When you put money in escrow, that's money that you that's money that you put at risk. If you as the agent don't do what you're supposed to do during the process, which is what we're here to learn today. So when you're the listing agent, don't accept offers with low escrow deposits. It's a waste of time. Of course, you could have you could have you could have uh, make a counter offer, so you could have scratched the three thousand, make it official, counter offer, not verbally. If you only do it verbally, then it's no good because mm -hmm. the the buy the seller you could have scratched the three thousand and put six thousand or or something like that, and have the seller initial that and submit the counter offer to the buyer agent. That way. If they don't accept it, then at least your buyer, your seller, um, was agreed with your with, with your recommendation, and you're not in trouble. But you, if you only do it verbally, then there's no proof that there was a negotiation being being done. So when you when you have to do a counter offer, yes, I personally like to do the counter offers verbally. But then once I do it verbally, I put it on paper and send it. See, see what I mean? I'm, mm -hmm. I don't just leave it at, at verbal negotiations. I put it on paper and send it. So um, any other questions as far as the escrow is concerned? Mm -hmm. No, we're good there? All right. Yes. Uh, line 29, it says, does the escrow accompany the offer or does the escrow is going to be made within X amount of days after the effective day, after the, pro the offer is accepted? On a on a on a ideal scenario, I like to submit the offer with the escrow. In an ideal scenario, I like to submit the offer with the escrow. Why? Because it shows more commitment from who, from the buyer, and from who, from me as the mm -hmm. agent. It shows the listing agent and it shows the seller that we are for real. That, that we mm -hmm. really want to buy this property because most offers are sent with um, escrow will be deposited. This one, the second box escrows will be deposited within three days of, yes. of acceptance of execution. I mean, you can do that too, but after the seller signs, after the seller signs, the escrow, there's three days for that seller not to submit the, for that buyer not to submit the escrow. So there's still room for the set, for the buyer to back out of the deal. So I don't want to, you know, I, I want to tell the seller, listen, we are here and we are here to buy. So if you guys can ask for the deposit, ask for the deposit, the deposit, you make a, you take a copy, you, you take a picture of the check and you include that copy of the check with the offer so that the buy the listing agent and the seller can see that there's already a deposit and obviously you check box number one okay um if not then you do check box number two and you do two days or three days or you know it doesn't have to be three days by the way you can say one day after 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 approval oh. okay you can do one day you can do two days you can do three days or you can do 20 days it's up to you obviously the more days you you write down the you know more a bigger window there is for for the deal to fail mm -hmm. through to fall through all right so i don't know let's just say two days then, then again my my intent with this video, even if we don't go through the entire contract, is so that you guys understand the concepts rather than trying to memorize what to put down. So that's why I'm changing. Usually a lot of people do three days, but I'm going to leave it at one day because it doesn't matter. You can do one day. You can get the offer accepted and let's put the offer, let's put the escrow right away because that's also putting pressure on the buyer to make sure that the buyer stays in the game 
because I don't want to do the work. I don't want to spend time writing in a, a contract instead of playing with my kids or, or playing soccer or doing whatever uh, if, mm -hmm. if, 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 if the buyer is not a serious buyer. All right. So you don't have to do three days necessarily. So I don't know. What, what do we say? We say $10,000 in escrow and we'll say one day. Then here we'll put the information for the title company. You know, that's standard. So let's go to line 35. Additional deposit, which was uh, was um, what Andres was, was saying. Um, and, and I know he likes to do that a lot. Andres likes to uh, split the, the escrow in two deposits. And here's where you do it. You can say that an additional, in, in line 35, an additional deposit to be delivered to escrow agent within how many days? I don't know, 10 days, yes. seven days, 15 days. I don't know what determines when that second deposit is going to be made. It's usually, usually after the inspection period, not the day of, the, no, not the day of the inspection period uh, end date. It's the day after or two days after the inspection period ends is when we should do the additional deposit if that's the route you want to take, okay? Uh, so let's just say that we put on the contract 10-day inspection period, all right? So if we do 10 days, I'll do here either 11 or 12 of 12 days. It's mandatory, the additional deposit? Correct. Correct. And Joe, so Andres was saying that the reason why we do this is to give us a window of time that if there is negotiations to be made with the inspection report, we have time to finish up the negotiations and then submit the, the second payment. All right. Because if we make the uh, second deposit due the same day the inspection period ends, and we're still in the middle of the negotiation of an inspection problem, we are bound to put that deposit. We're obligated to make that second deposit. And if we're not, then we're out of contract. So that's why you want to make sure that you do, if you are going to do a second deposit, you, you give yourself some time after the inspection period. And Joe, your, your question was what? It's mandatory to... Um to do additional deposit? No, it's not mandatory. Actually, I don't like to do second deposits. I, I, wanna, I wanna come in in my offers. I like to come in with everything I have. No, if, if, I, if I'm able to convince my client to do 20,000 in escrow deposit, let's do it. Let's do 20,000 and let's be the strongest offer possible from the get-go. Um, but some, some clients don't wanna do that. You know, sometimes the buyer themselves say, no, I want to do 10,000 and 10,000 and after the inspection period, that's fine. But I try not to do it. And also it's more work for me because when that time comes, when the time for the second deposit comes, I have to be on top of my client. Did you make the deposit? Did you send me the letters? Oh, call in the title company, send me the escrow letter. Oh, they have sent it to me. And, and I mean, honestly, I'm a hardworking person, but I want to work as little as possible. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't want to do, I don't want to do unnecessary work. Honestly, there's, there's no need, but sometimes you have to. All right. So that's line 35 for you. Uh, let's just say for the, for the sake of the training, let's just say that we're doing another 10,000 in escrow, the, a, a second deposit so that we can fill in the blanks and uh, financing, please, 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 please read this line, line 38, express as a dollar amount or percentage, the, the, the amount of the loan, the loan amount. So express as a dollar amount or percentage. Why don't put balance? Some agents put in this line balance. There's no, there's no such a thing as balance, all right? You need to work with real and precise numbers. The only information that is 
that you can account for is the one that is clister, crystal clear, okay? And I, I, Giovanni Hernandez, prefer to do the math and do the number, not the percentage. So let's just say that if someone has a calculator really quick, what is 5% of, um, I'm sorry, 95% of 410,000? Three eighty nine, five hundred. So in this case, my client is do is buying conventional five percent down payment, uh, putting twenty thousand in escrow, ten thousand dollars up front, ten thousand uh, dollars with a second deposit after the inspection period, and he's financing three hundred eighty nine thousand five hundred dollars. And here, you're not gonna see it. Well, you might see it in Orlando or Tampa, but here, this line 39, believe it or not, you can have as other, you can have jewelry, you can have a car, you can have another property, you can have uh, land, you can have something as partial payment of, of uh, that purchase. Now, that's easy to do when you're doing a cash purchase. Oh, that's why it has to be a cash purchase because it's a negotiation between buyer and seller. When you're doing financing, it's a no no. There's there's no there's no partial payment with a Rolex or a partial <laughs> payment with a with a uh, antique car. No, there's none of that. All right. I'm just saying what it is. I'm just telling you what it is. But you know, we're not gonna find it. If there's a cash purchase, yes, you you can do it. I done I done. I, as a matter of fact, right now I'm doing one as a, as a condo, $650,000, and the buyer is paying $250,000 with another property and buying and paying $400,000 cash for the balance. So it's, it's a $650,000 condo that is being bought, and that seller is receiving a $250,000 a smaller condo and $400,000 cash. Wow. That's good. The appraiser, <laughs> there's no appraiser because the bank, there's no bank. Yeah. If, if, if the buyer and seller want to hire an appraiser for each property and that's what they want to do, that's what they want to do. In this case, we're not appraising anything. They, you know, they, they know the area, they, they know where they are and they feel comfortable with the price and they agree to it. We actually sat down. Uh, which usually is not done that way, but we sat down there, all of us, buyer agent, listing agent, um, uh, buyer and myself, and we negotiated the terms of the, of the deal. And that's what we're doing. And hopefully we'll, we'll close that next week. All right. So that's what line 39 is. However, line 40 is balanced to close. So in this line is where you do not also do not use the word balance on this line over here on line 39 do not use the word balance okay let's find out what the balance is to close so we're doing we're buying the property for need a calculator calculator All right, so we're buying the property for $410,000. We're doing $20,000 in escrow that we already have. Mm -hmm. And we're doing financing for $389,500. So there's a balance of $500. That's what goes here, $500. Okay? Now, let me show you something because this has happened to me before. Actually, when I work especially when I work with NACA deals. If my client would have put here $20,000 in escrow, the first uh, from the get-go, plus the $10,000 in escrow, that means that 410,000 minus 30,000 in escrow minus 389,500. We would have had $9,500 
positive credit, positive cash mm -hmm. for the buyer, for the buyer. That's fine. That's, that's not a problem. That, you can do that. And if that's the case, then I would have done 9,000 minus 9,500. You guys see that? Oh, see. That, no. You, you don't? Ah, there. okay. He has you, you, you see it. Oh, okay. That's a credit. But, on that's a credit. Now, that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that the buyer right. is gonna go home with nine thousand five hundred. Why does it mean that? Because there's still closing costs. Yeah. That the buyer needs to cover at closing. So that money is gonna be used towards the closing cost. It's just that the buyer put more money towards escrow than needed for the purchase price of the property because mm -hmm. what we're talking about here in this paragraph is only money for the purchase here we don't include or we don't talk about closing cost okay. closing cost is the the work the job the responsibility of who for the buyer of the loan officer the loan officer the loan officer, I'm not the loan officer. I'm the realtor. I only deal with, ha with whatever they has to do with the property, not with the loan. So if the buyer has questions about the loan, if the buyer has questions about closing costs, refer the buyer to the loan officer. Hopefully you work with the loan officer that you know each other or that you feel comfortable working with and it's a, it's a, it's a good conversation or communication. But if not, refer, still refer the buyer to the loan officer, okay? So do we understand so far where we are? Um, mm -hmm. the, the concepts, we understand the concepts, guys? Yes. yes. All right. Okay, oh my goodness. It's almost an hour already and we haven't even finished the first page. Wow. So I think we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to do this class in parts two and three. <laughs> All right, so let's go to, uh, line 45, um, the offer should be valid for how many days? Two. Two days? Yes. How many days, Melissa? Three days. Three days, Angel, says Angel. Kelsey, how many days? Kelsey? I think three days as well. Three days as well? Okay, well, how about actually, Eileen? No, ten, maybe ten. Ten. 10 days. Andres, how many days should we make the offer valid? Five days. One day. It depends. Kelsey, it depends on what? No, it was Wendy. Oh, Wendy. <laughs> oh, no, Wendy, you're not allowed to answer because you know the answer. <laughs> no. you're not, you, you know the answer. All right, guys. Okay. Um, uh, it depends. Okay. This is, this is not an arbitrary decision that I make or that the buyer makes. You have to talk to the listing agent and you have to find out from the listing agent when the offer is going to be read. If you don't do that and you send, let's, let's just, today is what, Thursday. So I'm gonna mm -hmm. submit an offer today. Today is Thursday. I'm gonna submit an offer today. If I, if I, if I only give, if I make that offer valid for one day, it's tomorrow or two days, it's Saturday. Tomorrow's Friday, Saturday. And, I, and if, I don't, if I don't ask the listing agent and I don't find out that the listing agent with the buyers, with the sellers are reading the offers on Monday, my offer, by the time it yes. gets to Monday, my offer is no longer valid. And the listing agent, if I'm the listing agent of that offer, trust me, guys, you offer, I'm not even going to entertain it because you didn't have the professionalism of calling me and the courtesy of calling me to find out when we were going to read the offer. So the offer is not valid for, when, for whenever you like. The offer is valid after you speak to the listing agent and you find out when the offer is going to be read. That's what you put in there. Because you might, you might ask the, the listing agent, the simple question, when are you guys reading the offers? Are you reading the offers once they come in 
or you're putting the offers together and reading them tonight, tomorrow night, uh, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, when, when? If the agent tells me the offers are being, are being read as they come in, I'm going to make my offer valid for 24 hours. I, I don't need to make it valid for two days or three or four or five days. If the, if the listing agent tells me, the you know, we're going to read the offers on Sunday, then I have to make my offer valid until Sunday or even until Monday. You, you follow me? So, again, I don't want you to learn what number to put in there. I want you to understand the concept yeah. so that you know how to handle the, the, the offer. And all this is because you have to make every, you have to do everything that you can to make the offer as strong as possible, as appealing as possible to the listing agent and to the, to the buyer, to the seller, to the sellers. Okay. So I don't know. So we called the agent and Carmen is the listing agent. She tells me that She's going to party this weekend. She's not going to read any offers and uh, they'll be reading the offers on Monday. So I'll make the offer valid uh, through September 13th. What am I going to do? I have to wait for Carmen to stop partying. <laughs> and she's going to go partying without Andres. So imagine <laughs> All right. So do we understand each other, guys? Are, are we clear on that, on that um, line? Line 45? Yes. Yes. All right. Line 52. The closing date. When is the closing date? The date the loan office is set. It, it all depends. If it's a cash deal, it's normally 30 to 35. All right. So if, uh, Gertha is saying oh, that if it's a cash deal, it's normally 30 to 35. And um, finance is normally 40 to 45, depend. And, and Gertha says uh, if it's financing between 40 and 45 days. Anybody else? Isn't it on the day that both parties agree on? K Kelsey says uh, it's upon the day that both parties agree on. Carla, what do you say? Oh, the closing day, the loan officer. The loan officer, I think this is. Correct. Is the loan officer, Gertha, is the loan officer, uh, Kelsey, okay. the loan officer is who gives you the idea of what day is a good day to close the purchase. And if it is a cash purchase, it's not 30 days either. Oh. Who, who will help you determine how many days do we need to close a cash purchase? The loan Oh, the, the buyer. Who? Who? The seller. The seller. Title company. If, if, if there's association. And the association. Correct. Yeah, but let's just say that it's the association to make it simple for the realtor. We, we, I know what we're talking, that's some information that we'll give the, the realtor. But yes, even if it's a cash purchase, Gertha and everybody, you don't put 30 days just because you feel like putting 30 days. Okay. You have to find out if there's an association, if there's a condo association, if it's a homeowner's association, and how long does it take to A, get the buyer approved by the association and b if it's a condo we need condo questionnaire so we need to find mm. out about that we also need to so let's just say there's no condo association or there's no association there's no hoa but yet the title company that the buyer wants to work with or the seller wants to work with i have to ask them how long it will take them to have the the, the closing package ready the closing package includes title work, lien search, title search, um, survey, and, and whatever else, uh, title insurance and all of that. So if the title company tells me we can have the package in 20 days, then maybe we can close in 20 days. If they tell me we can have the package ready in 30 days, then we have to close in 30 days. Andres. Uh, we, we, we had um, Carmen close on a lot, cash. And it took her six months to close on that lot 
because the title company couldn't produce and title work, a uh, clear and marketable title. So the property couldn't be sold. So okay. it's, again, understand the concept and, and, and understand there's, there's not a set number for anything. There's no such a thing as usually, that's what we do. No, there's no usually about anything. I done deals. I, I, I submitted an offer. I closed on a deal back in February, I think it was, March, where I entered into contract. I, I, I got an executed contract in September of 2020. And I closed in February 2021. But not only there were issues with the title, but there were tenants that, that, that the buyers couldn't buy the property because there were tenants, so we needed to wait three months. So the dates that usually used, <laughs> are, they didn't work. I, I needed to find out exactly what needed to be done and what kind of days will work for that particular transaction. So again, call the loan officer and find out where you guys are in terms of possibilities of closing the deal. So I don't know, Let's, what, what's day? Today is September 9th. Mm -hmm. um, so Andres is the loan officer. Andres, when can we close this deal? No, it's not a condo, it's a single family home. If it's a conventional. 95% down payment. Autobay. 35 days. So Andres is saying 35 days. So what do we have to do? Uh, if, if supposedly the offer is going to be accepted by September 13, so by October 13, there should be 30 days or so, you know, one day less, one day more. So mm -hmm. I don't know. Let's just say October 19. <laughs> All right, just about, okay? So, all right, so usually, <laughs> usually uh, people like to be fancy and, 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 and make, make people believe that if we do the, the, the date and then we write on or before, or before, before that loan is actually going to close before. The truth of the matter, when it comes to the, to the, to the reality of things, the bank is going to 99% of the time close on the date, not before. You know, okay. sometimes you're able to push it a day, maybe two days or, or, you know, but they're not gonna close a week or two weeks before. So yes, you could, and I do this, I, I do it myself, I do uh, October 19, 2020, or, sorry. Or, oh, come on. Or, on, or, ah, es que lo tengo. Or, on, or, before. <laughs> I usually do it like that, just to tell the list the, the listing agent and the buyer agent that, like I said, that, that we are real, that, that we are eager to close, that we want to close as soon as possible. So I use it more as a marketing, like more as a marketing tool, if, if you want to call it like that. Um, but in reality, it usually doesn't close before that day. Andres. Mm -hmm. oh, Jesus. <laughs> wow. It's a yeah, but that's, but, but, but that's the responsibility of the, of the loan officer. The, buy, the, the realtors, correct, but the, the, the realtors, our responsibility, our responsibility as realtors is when I get the client, I'll ask for the approval letter 
and the loan officer's information. And I called the loan officer to find out where that approval is in the, in the process, okay? It's not my job as the realtor to make sure that the loan officer has the information. It's the responsibility of the loan officer get the information from the buyer. Now, having said that, if I want to make sure that everything goes as smooth, I can help. But it's not my obligation as the realtor. I want to, you know, I want everybody to understand that. If I'm, if I'm able to help, yes, I'm going to help. But the loan officer is going to make their commission and I'm going to make my commission. The loan officer has to work for their commission and the realtor has to work for their commission. Okay. Well, because you should have, have you should have already the approval letter. If you don't, if you don't have a pre-approval, what are you doing showing properties to client? Right. You, you, correct, but that's but that's a, but that but you weren't their loan officer. Yeah, but that's a different story. Because one thing is, when you're good, you're good. Since you are a good loan officer, you have realtors that may get an approval from a different lender. And then once they have an offer, they give you the deal. <laughs> but that's a different story. You know, in a, in a regular in a regular <laughs> scenario, the loan officer is going to work with, with that buyer and that, that buyer agent. So the, that loan officer already has the information. But if... but. To the point the Andres is trying to make is true. If you, as a buyer agent, uh, after you spoke to that loan officer and you don't really feel comfortable with the loan officer that the buyer is working with and you want to give it a, sh a, a, a try to one of your loan officers, then you do have to make sure that that loan officer has all the information. Because if you're planning to try, if you're planning to uh, change loan officers, you better be ahead of the game um, in order to change loan officers. So mm -hmm. yes, if you plan to change loan officers, you, you gotta help, absolutely. Correct, so, so, so I'm gonna, let, let's recap on this, on, on this first page. Let, let's recap. So the information that is put on this first page, most of it really comes from you talking to the loan officer yeah. to mm -hmm. find out when are you going to be able to close, what type of loan you're doing, mm -hmm. uh, and talking to the listing agent right. to find out when the offers are going to be read. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. what's important for the seller on making the decision. And what I mean by that, what I mean by that is that to, to the contrary of the common belief that more money is what determines what, a, what the, set, the offer that the seller is going to choose, it is very important to offer more money if possible. But if, if you offer purchase price, if you offer asking price, but you're putting 20% down payment and the seller needs to stay in the house uh, 30 days after closing or 44 or 45 days after closing, and you can accommodate your offer to meet the seller's needs. Even if you don't offer more money than someone else, your offer might be a stronger offer than the offer that is offering $10,000 yes. over asking price, but it needs to close in 30 days because the buyer needs to move into the house in 30 days. See what I mean? So try to understand and grasp the idea as opposed to memorizing the numbers that go into the each, each and single line, each line. Okay. okay. All right, so questions so far? No. No, we're good. Uh, all right. So, all right. All right. So let's move to line 68. Oh, this is important. Mm -hmm. Line 68. Yes. If the property that you want to submit an offer on, if that property is rented, and when I mean Which by rented, 68, 68. 68. 
I'm sorry? Yeah, line 68, line 68. If that property is being rented, and when I mean by rented, I mean someone other than the owner is living in the property. If the property is being rented and paying rent, even if it's a dollar, but if it's rented, you need to mark this line. You need to mark mm -hmm. this box, box 68. If you submit the offer and the property is rented and you don't select that box, that means that you and your buyer are not a lot. Well, you could ask for copies of the, of the lease yes. and you can ask for what is called a tenant estoppel letter, mm -hmm. but the seller is not obligated to give you anything. Okay. Wow. So you might have to buy that property because if let's just say that the inspection period already passed, you're not able to get out of the contract. And since you didn't mark that box, the seller doesn't have to provide that information to you. And if they have deposits, how will you know how much money they have in deposits? And if you buy the property like that, and once the tenant is wants to leave, now the lease is over or whatever, the, the tenant can say, oh, you know, I, I had $10,000 in deposits. How are you going to prove that that wasn't true? I mean, there are, there are mechanisms to do that, but it's a pain in the neck. And you have to buy the property with the current tenant without knowing what type of lease is in place. Oh. So you have to check this Thank box. You. you have to check this box in order for you to ask and be given the current lease, copy of the current lease, and the tenant estoppel letter. The tenant estoppel letter is the document that both the landlord and the tenant sign stating what is the current rent amount, what is the current deposit, secured deposit, and what is the current, if, and if the, the, the tenant is up to date with the, with the rent or not, okay? So that way you know exactly, your buyer for that matter, you and your buyer know exactly uh, where you are, in if you're getting any money, credit, if you're getting any credits from the, from the landlord. Uh, so you need to punch this line 68 if it's, if it's rented. If it's not, then you don't have to, you know, if it's not, then you don't have to worry about it about it but if it is then you have to check it all right are we guys are, are, is everybody clear on this line 68 yes yes okay yes all right so let's talk about line 77 uh, the can this contract be assigned uh box number one uh buyer may assign and thereby be released from any further liabilities under this contract. Box number two may assign but not be released from liability under this contract or may not assign this contract. Basically, what says here, the first box, it says that I'm the buyer. And if I check this box, I'm telling the seller, Mr. Seller, you know, assign this contract to me let's execute this contract and sometime before sometime in between the day you accept the contract and we go to closing i can assign the contract to someone else even if that someone else doesn't qualify but mm -hmm. since you're giving me the authority to assign the contract i will assign the contract to someone else without your authorization, not without your authorization because you're already given it to me, but right. without your previous knowledge. And I am relief from any liability. So whatever money you have in escrow for me, you have to give it back to me, regardless of where we are in the contract. That's what it says. That's wow. what that box means, okay? So, I mean, if you're sending me an offer, I'm the buy, I'm the seller, and you're sending me an offer, I'm the listing agent, you're sending me an offer with, with this box check, that, that offer is not even good for, you guys know what. I mean, 
I'm, right. I'm, I'm, I'm not accepting that offer at all, at right. all, okay? Now, the second box, the second box, it says may assign, but not be released from liability under this contract, okay? That usually is done when someone is buying a property and they're gonna buy it under a corporation name, but they haven't opened the corporation yet. So they're in the middle of opening the corporation, but who's gonna be the owner of the corporation? Me, I'm, I'm the buyer. I haven't opened up my corporation yet. So so if, if since I don't have the name of the corporation yet, I'm not gonna, my, the name that is gonna go here as the buyer is gonna be Giovanni Hernandez, right? As opposed to, I don't know, X, Y, and Z Realty, right? But uh, if, if, if I already opened up X, Y, and Z Realty, uh, then I will put my name in here. But if not, I can, I, can be, I can be the buyer and I can say may assign, but not be released. So I can assign the contract to the company, but I'm still liable for everything within the contract. So, okay, let's, we, we can do that. We can deal with that every day, all day. That's, that's not a problem, all right? Okay. And the, the cleaner version, if you will, the, the most common version is may not assign this contract, meaning that if Giovanni Hernandez is the one entering into this contract, Giovanni Hernandez may not assign the contract to anybody else mm -hmm. unless the seller signs on the addendum assigning a con the contract to someone else. Mm -hmm. And the most common scenario where that happens is when husband and wife are buying the property, the, the husband is the one getting pre-qualified, is the one doing the loan, and the buyer agent never ask, never bothered to ask if they were married, because if they're married, you can put the husband and the, the husband's name and the wife's name on the contract from the get go, from the very first day. You can put the offer, you can write up the offer with the husband and the wife's name, even if the husband is the only one on the loan. Okay. So sometimes the buyer agent doesn't do it. And then, you know, the day before closing or two days before closing, Oops, you know, um, the, the wife is going to be on title, but the bank wants an addendum uh, including the wife on title. So there, it's an there the contract is being assigned to someone else. You know, we're, we're adding someone else that's assigning the contract. Okay. okay? So are we clear on this um, paragraph number seven, assignability? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, perfect. All right, so I'll tell you what, guys. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna finish this page. Mm -hmm. By the time we finish, it's gonna be like 1140. So mm -hmm. we'll, we'll do this, this seminar with these first two pages and I'll do, you know, I'll do another, another seminar in English next week to okay. go over some of the other pages. All right, so financing, okay. Uh, line 82, very, very straightforward. It's a buyer will pay cash for the purchase of this property at closing. There is no financing contingency to buyer's obligation to close. If buyer obtains a loan for any part of the purchase price of the property, buyer acknowledges that any terms and conditions imposed by buyer's lenders should not affect or extend the buyer's obligation to close. I want to I talk about this. When someone is buying cash, does not mean that that buyer is jumping over the cliff on, on this purchase. What I mean by that is that the buyer is, still has the right to do an inspection the buyer still has the right for an appraisal, okay? So buying the property cash does not mean the buyer is buying the property with their eyes closed. Buying the property in cash, it only means that they don't need a lender. 
but you still are allowed and should be doing an inspection and should do an appraisal as well. Because if, the, if I'm buying cash, I'm buying this property, $410,000 cash, and the appraisal comes in at 350, why should I pay $410,000 for it? Unless I feel like it, you know, if, if I don't care, mm -hmm. I don't care, I'll pay for it. But if not, it doesn't, if it doesn't make financial sense, uh, if it doesn't make financial sense, then I shouldn't pay $410,000. Mm -hmm. so, so I want everybody to understand that buying a cash does not mean that the buyer uh, is not entitled to an inspection report and to an appraisal report. Okay, everybody's clear on that? Yes. Okay, so if we're doing, let's just say that we're not being, we're not, we're not rich enough, so we have to finance this loan. Mm -hmm. Let's check box 86. This is a conventional. I always, I, sometimes I get, I get offers with conventional FHA and VA. They, they mark the, the three boxes. It doesn't work like that. What kind of loan, what kind of offer is being submitted? Even if the buyer is pre-qualified for a conventional and an FHA loan, meaning that the buyer could go either route you have to choose the loan that you're submitting, the, the offer that you're submitting. So in this particular case, it's a VA, or you can do, if you're doing a hard money loan or you're doing a private loan, you can do mm -hmm. other and you can type hard money loan. Hard money loan is the same as private lending, okay? Um, so I wouldn't check conventional, I'll check other and do hard money loan. Um, but in this case, it's conventional for, for this purpose. It's a conventional loan. So here it is, line 87. How many days? Um, but uh, if I start reading on line 86, it reads, this contract is contingent upon buyer obtaining approval of a conventional loan within, I'm on line 87 now, within X amount of days after effective date. That is also called loan approval period. Does everybody see that on line yes. 86 and 87, the beginning of 87, loan approval period. Mm -hmm. If you don't put anything in there, it's 30 days, yes. all right? but it's not true. It's not true for two reasons. One, you have to ask your loan officer when that approval letter is going to be ready, okay? When that approval letter is going to be ready. And the approval letter period ends five days before closing. I want you to understand that. So if I'm putting a 30 day closing, okay. And I didn't fill in this space. I didn't fill in this space here. I left it blank. So if I leave it blank, it's the same as 30. And my closing is in 30 days from the approved, from the execution date. When is the approval letter period? When is the approval period? When is the approval, the approval period, period ends? When does it end? So it ends 25 days after the, uh, the, the, uh, the effective date of the contract. So even if you did not fill in the blank, you left it blank, believing that you are asking for 30 days, but you have a 30 day closing, you're not getting 30 days for the approval per for the approval period. You're only getting 25 days because the approval period ends at the most five days prior to closing. So if we are closing in, like uh, uh, Andres told me that we can close this loan in 35 days. So in this particular day, in this particular loan, we could do 30 days. But if Andres, if, if I would have had 30 days, I would have had to put here 
25 My days. If it would have been 31 days for closing, I could do 26 days here. But so please, 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 please understand that if you, if you don't fill in the blank and you're closing in 30 days or whenever, 30 days or less, the period, the approval period ends five days prior to closing. Okay. It's not 30 days if you leave it blank. And I had had realtors of Fortex Realty that had issues with that. And, and it wasn't pretty. All right. So, so make sure that, that we know that. Okay. So in this particular case, I'm going to do 30 days just because Andres told me to do to close in 30 days and 35 days. You're out of contract. Yeah, that, uh, Carmen. So what Carmen says is that if because the the, the approval letter, the, the loan office. Oh, thank you, thank you for stopping me there. Okay, I want to I want I want to make something very very clear as well. When you're working with a buyer, as a realtor, you have what is called a fiduciary responsibility with that buyer. Okay. That is something that only applies to me as the realtor, not the loan officer. The loan officer doesn't have any fiduciary responsibilities <laughs> with the uh, borrower, um, at least not on the real estate side, okay? So it's my responsibility and mine only, mine, mine only, to make sure that the um, approval letter period does not expire without me asking and getting that approval letter and submitting the approval letter to the listing agent within the uh, approval letter period. Is everybody clear on that? It's my responsibility and my alone. If the loan officer doesn't give it to me, and I forget to send it to the listing agent, and then we, and then the loan doesn't close, and my client loses their escrow. Guess who's gonna have to pay for that escrow? Me. Yeah, right. Agent. Yeah. <laughs> the agent is responsible for covering that escrow. Okay. You know, and and if you know, if I'm struggling as it is to make good money uh, in the real estate business. Imagine if I have to start paying escrows that I didn't <laughs> close on and I have to pay a $5,000 escrow. If I don't have the escrow, if I don't have the money to cover the escrow, what's gonna happen? The insurance that the DVPR offers is gonna cover that escrow, the $5,000 and the 10,000, and they're gonna suspend your license. Until when? Until you pay for it. So you still have to pay for it. Or you're not gonna ever, you're not gonna be a realtor anymore, okay? So it's your responsibility and only your responsibility to make sure to send that letter, that approval letter, within the approval letter period, okay? Tattoo it in your arm, in your <laughs> forehead. So every time you look at your mirror and you're combing your hair, you you remember that day. Please don't forget that day. So that's line number 30, line number 87. Uh, line number 88, I have to identify if it's a uh, fixed it's loan, fixed interest rate, mm -hmm. if it's an adjustable, or if it's a fixed or adjustable. You know, if I'm doing a regular 30 year loan, either FHA or conventional, you know, chances are yeah. we're dealing with the fixed. But if we're doing, a combo loan, you know, pro properties in the, uh, I don't know, five, six, $700,000, we might be looking at a fixed or adjustable rate because we're doing two loans or what have you. So how do you know how to answer line 88? Can someone tell me? Loan officer. Oh my God, very good. Loan officer. <laughs> Everybody's understanding the concept and that's what this, this training is for. Understand the concept. You don't answer the question 
arbitrarily. You don't guess, you don't, yeah. All right, so let's see. Andres, is this a, a fixed rate, conventional? I mean, a fixed rate or fixed? All right, so it's a fixed rate. And then um, line 89, it talks about the interest rate that the borrower has on this particular loan. How do I know what interest rate the borrower is getting on this loan? Don't. You gotta ask. Ask who, Bertha? Uh -huh. Loan officer. Loan officer. Does everybody <laughs> understand that? Because not everybody is answering the question. So I want to make sure that everybody is in, in the same in the same boat. Yes. Um, so talk to your loan officer. Find out what the interest rate is, and that's what you put in there. And then um, line ninety. How long is the the loan for? Everybody's ask. Ask. Everybody's quick to type thirty years. I know. You don't know. You, you can know. do an FHA amortize over 20 years. You can do mm -hmm. an FHA loan for 25 years. Heck, you can do an, FH, an FHA or conventional loan for 15 years. So you don't assume anything. You ask the loan officer. And by the way, guys, understand one thing. That loan officer on that particular transaction has to become your best friend. Yeah. So you might as well <laughs> talk to the loan officer. Not once, not twice, but as many times as you need to, to make the transaction as smooth as possible and to ensure that you close on this deal. Because we don't make money if we don't. People, okay. and so- Oh, if you don't ask. No, we don't make don't, money if we oh, don't- Oh, if you assume. Work. We don't make money if we don't- Ask. Close. Close. Oh, close. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. sorry. We don't make money if we don't close. That's true. <laughs> All right. So everything that we do from the beginning, from asking the, the buyer the right questions, talking to the loan officer, speaking to the listing agent, understanding what the needs are of the seller to make our offer as strong as possible, filling in the information correctly, asking the loan officer to verify the information is to close on the deal to close on the deal. So you ask the loan officer, Andres, what kind of uh, loan is this? Is it a 30-year fix? So it's a 30-year fix. You guys notice something? I'm asking the loan officer for, for real. Uh, I have a loan officer here sitting with us and I'm asking the loan officer because that's what I do. I ask the loan officer. Carmen says that a lot of that information that, that, that we ask the loan officer is in the, the DU or the LP that the loan officer gives us when they send us the approval. It's true, Carmen. A lot of the information is there, but not all of it is there, okay? And especially if you get um, an approval letter instead of a DU in the approval letter, it doesn't really tell you much. So you have to ask the loan officer. But most importantly, you have to ask the loan officer because you have to develop a relationship with the loan officer because he has to become, he or she has to become your friend in this transaction. Even if afterwards, after the transaction closes, you didn't speak to that person anymore, who cares? But during the transaction, you guys were buddies. You have to understand that, all right? Okay, and uh, line 91, buyer, should make mortgage loan application for the financing within, if you leave it blank, it's five days, if you leave it blank, okay? What does that mean? It means that after we have uh, an effective day, after we the contract is executed, the buyer, the borrower has to go to the loan officer and has to fill out an actual loan application because 99% of the time, before that, the, the, the borrower never filled out a loan application. They just filled out a 1003 and basic information, but they didn't sign an actual loan application. So that's what it means by buyers should make mortgage loan application for the financing within three days or five days or whatever, okay? 
Now, why is this important, guys? And this has happened, and it does happen a lot. Let's just say that we leave it blank five days, which is five days, or we type five days. Is everybody with me on line 91? One. Yes. Okay. So let's say that it's five days. And the buyer, the borrower, my client, does not fill out the application, does not sign the actual application with the loan officer within those five days. It took that loan officer uh, or, or that borrower seven days to sign the loan application and start the loan process, okay? And let's just say that, you know, nothing happens, everybody is happy, the process, the process starts and the loan approval period ends on Monday. This coming up, this Monday coming up, okay? And it's not ready. The loan approval is not ready. So the, the loan officer tells me, hey, Giovanni, you know, sorry, man. The, 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 the borrower, it took him more than a week to sign the application. So I don't have the loan approval for you. Um, oh, so what do I do? I have to try to get an extension on the loan approval period. Okay. So I go to the listing agent and I ask the listing agent, listen, uh, Tatiana, can you give me an extension on the loan approval period? Because I don't have the loan approval uh, from the lender. Oh, well, you know what? Yeah, I, oh, let, me, let me talk to my, to my client, to the seller. And the seller comes back. Yeah, we'll entertain the extension, but show me when that application was signed. Show me that the buyer is doing their due diligence to process the loan. And the loan application was signed seven days or eight days after the uh, um, effective day of the contract. That means that the buyer is out of contract. The buyer is out of contract. And if the seller wants to make that buyer jump through hoops for that escrow, the buyer, the seller can make that seller, that buyer jump through hoops for the escrow. So if you put five days here on line 91, it's your responsibility to push and to make sure that the buyer fails and signs the, the loan application with the loan officer. And how do you know if the buyer did that or not? You talk to the loan officer. Again, that loan officer is going to be your best friend. And when you get, and this, this I agree a lot with, with, with Andres, when you get an executed contract, don't sleep over that contract before you send it to everybody. You get the executed contract and you send it to the loan officer. You send it to the title company. You send it to the, the inspection company. You send it to the client itself. Because if you get a contract and you're working back and forth on the contract, all right? And we're going with offers, counter offers. So let's just say that I'm the realtor. I'm the buyer agent. Uh, Carla is my client, the buyer. And Carmen is the seller. And Tatiana is the listing agent. So I submitted the offer, Carla, I mean, Tatiana submitted it to, to her client. They made some changes. They made some changes and those changes needed to be signed by Carla, my, the buyer. Carla signs on the changes, okay? So as far as Carla is concerned, Carla is under contract because she does have a copy of all documents signed right? And I send the doc, the contract executed by my client, I send it to Tatiana, who is the listing agent. And Tatiana doesn't send the contract to the seller. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the seller decides not to, not, not to sell the property at the last minute, but Tatiana never sent the executed contract to the seller. Well, 
guess who was or who was under contract? Was Tatiana as the listing agent under contract or was the seller and Tatiana as sellers under contract? No, you were under contract. Tatiana, the listing agent was under contract, but not the seller because the seller never got a copy of the executed contract. So the seller is not bound by any terms of that contract. And the same goes around. If Tatiana is the listing agent, Tatiana accepts the offer, the seller accepts the offer um, and, and signs the changes that, that we made, Tatiana sends it to me and I don't send it to Carla, who's the buyer. And then Carla says, oh, you know what? I'm not gonna buy the house anymore. I decide to get out of the deal. She can, cause she's not in a deal. She's not under contract. I'm in the con I'm in contract. So if the buyer, if the seller wants to come after, wants to go after the buyer, they're not gonna be able to do so. So they're gonna go after me. So make sure that when you're doing that, when you're working on with a contract and you're signing the contract back and forth, your party, meaning your client, either the buyer or the seller, gets the copy of the fully executed contract. Does, does, is everybody with me on that? Yes. Yes. Correct. You have to be able to show that you send it to that person. Email is the easiest. Email is the easiest, the more, you know, fastest or secure or better yet. We have that loop and everything that you do in that loop, every email that you send out, every sign, every signature, signature that the clients do, they're recorded on, in that loop and you're not able to delete them. And that, that loop is approved by the DVPR as, as, as track, track record of the transaction. So if anything happens, we can refer back to that loop and look at the history of, the of that particular loop and we'll be able to find what happened, when, when and who did what or, or whatever, all right? So that's one of the reasons why we use that loop. Okay, so here we are, guys. Um, I'm gonna stop the, the the training here. Luis, you can stop recording now, and I'm gonna open the microphones. So for for, okay, for anybody to, to ask for to anybody to ask questions, let me let me do some. Hello. Can some Gertha? Can you okay? okay? But but let's.